All right, so one reason why we draw these inferences or show these kinds of biased interpretations is because of we walk around with schemas in our heads. I don't think we've formally discussed in lecture at least um, what a schema is yet, so let me take a moment to address this term. Um, this is a mental framework that is made up of the things that you've experienced in your life. So these are not things that you're born with or a structure that is already, you know, like innate. Um, you build your own schemas based on your own personal experience of the world. And so no two persons schemas look the same. Um, this is a schema that is in our textbook. And we've got, you know, our memory for a beach trip, our memory for summer camp, our memory for a family reunion. And what they're trying to illustrate is that there can be some overlapping nodes, right? You've got summer camp and the beach trip happening during summer break, right? Um, you've got the family reunion and summer camp, both including swimming. That's kind of weird that the beach trip isn't connected to swimming. I'm sorry, I would have connected beach trip and swimming also. Um, We've got, you know, how old the person was at these different events. We've got, you know, some details of what they did and where they went. So the family reunion and the beach trip were both California. Summer camp was in Montana. Man, this person goes on pretty big trips. Um, so we've got um, a variety of overlapping nodes, right? And so remember when we talked about spreading activation, if you think about any one of these nodes, it's going to spread its activation to its related nodes and the more strongly related the um, the nodes are the more likely that spreading activation is to occur so um, a schema and then a neural network as we've discussed it in the past these are very similar ideas very similar concepts um, so schemas may lead us to develop to um, produce biased interpretations because once we start thinking one thing it's going to cause us to start thinking about other things right and so we start pulling in our past experience our previous knowledge of this um, cue as we're attempting to um, you know solve the problem or, or retrieve the information and so um, bias could be due to schemas it could be due to inferences that we draw so here we have a an office um, so if I, you want to, you can play along and you can pause me and list everything you can remember from that office. Don't look back at it. If you don't feel like playing, that's okay too. All right, so my big question, hopefully you're back after having written a list if you're playing along. Um, did you list books in your memory of things that were in that office? Nine out of the 30 participants in the study listed books as being present in that office. Whoops. Um, let me go back this way to show you. Whoops, where'd my picture go? There's, there are no books in this office. There are things on the shelves, but they aren't books. Um, we have a tendency to infer that an office would contain books. And so nine out of 30 participants recalled books being there. Here's the thing. It's not necessarily because they actually think they saw books. It's because they knew that they were listing things that belong in an office. And so when they didn't necessarily remember something, but they thought that their list should be longer than it was yet, they just started listing things that belong in offices. Um, so that's what we call an inference. What would belong in an office? I don't remember if I saw it or not, but I'm pretty sure there should be books there, right? Um, that kind of inference usually serves us pretty well. I'll bet that if we just wrote down all the things that belong in an office, some of those things are in that office. Um, so why not? You know, there's table, there's a chair, there's, you, know, you just start writing stuff. Um, some of that's probably there. Um, so there's this phenomenon that I have labeled. I don't know if this is her real name. Um, I know that the real name is semantic equivalence, but I've, I've labeled some people I know as having tendencies to be semantic equivalent prone. My son is the king of the semantic equivalents. Um, when he was little, we were at Pier 1, which doesn't exist anymore, so uh-oh. Um, but they had what is called a papazon chair. Some of you are familiar with papazon chairs. So the next time we came back to the to the Pier 1, he was probably 10 years old in this story in his defense. He goes, I want to see the daddy chair. 
And I'm like, what are you talking about? What daddy chair are you talking about? And then finally he found it and he goes this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a Papasan chair. I get it. I see why you're calling it the daddy chair. Okay, I get that. <laughs> that is semantic equivalent, I guess. It's not what Papasan means at all, but okay. Uh, it sounds right. He drew an inference. It's called Papasan, so it's probably the daddy's chair. <laughs> So, um, he was really big on that when he was little, coming up with words that um, were semantically equivalent but were not um, the correct word in the context, and that's because he was drawing inferences, which is great. It showed that he was seeing the connections between what he knows and what he's experiencing. And uh, so, again, I'm going to argue that some of these sins of commission may cause us to say wrong things, Papa's on and Daddy Chair. But it also shows that we're actually making connections and we are realizing um, consistencies and stuff like that. And that's what makes things memorable. So I'm not going to be mad at inferences. Um, another sin of commission is persistence. Persistence could be described as a form of interference. Um, and again, persistence indicates that there is organization to memory, that you don't just have a series of unrelated things all stored in your brain. Um, persistence can also suggest what you're preoccupied by, like what are you thinking about at the moment or what is um, something that keeps coming to mind for you. Um, here's an example. Um, you can call it a Freudian slip if you want or you can call it a slip of the tongue. Uh, the lawyer says to the judge, it was a slip of the tongue. I didn't mean to call you your alleged honor. <laughs> um, so slips of the tongue are um, examples of persistence where something that you're trying not to think about, something that you're trying not to retrieve is slipping in and interfering with what you are trying to retrieve or what you are trying to think about. And then spoonerisms, I've mentioned these a, a number of times. So a lamb of leg and a 10 pound dog of bag food. We've got a couple of spoonerisms going in on here. Um, a lamb of leg, so Spoonerisms are usually described as forming a new word or switching words like lamb of leg. Both of those are real words. You just sort of switch the um, order of them and you know a dog of bag food you just kind of switch the order of them. Um, so spoonerisms can be switches of whole words. It can be switches of the letters of the beginning of the words so that you've made kind of new words out of them. It turns out that spoonerisms that are pronounceable and that sound like real words are more likely to actually be uttered, right? We tend to stop ourselves when, when we're in the middle of saying something that's actually nonsense or it, if the second word is too hard to pronounce, we'll stop and we'll realize that we jumbled what we were trying to say. But if you can pronounce both of them like a lamb of leg, you'll probably utter that whole phrase and then realize, wait, did I just say that backwards? Um, so it shows what we might be thinking about. It shows how we might have things organized um, in our memories. So this kind of, these, these kinds of persistence examples are ones that illustrate again um, that memory is really um, complex. It's um, kind of hard work. And so sometimes stuff slips out. All right, now misattribution is where you have some kind of false memory. It could be um, not remembering where you heard this. It could be maybe not remembering whether this was something that you saw in a movie or did it really happen. Um, the older you get, I have to say, the more times you'll have that where it's like, did I see this on TV or did I actually do this? I don't remember at this point. Uh, fact versus fiction, and we'll talk a little bit about how autobiographical facts start to lose their personal relevance. They, you don't have that emotion anymore, and then now you're like just as attached to your autobiographical facts as you are to like some TV show that you watched. <laughs> you're like, it could have been me. It could have been a character on TV. I don't know who had this happen to him. Um, that's what we mean with false memories. Um, now, false memories can take the form of memories that get recovered um, either through dreams or hypnosis or you know some kind of strategy that we talked about with you know retrieving repressed memories um, a lot of times the ones that are memories of abuse are the ones that get the most attention but 
we can have false memories of a lot of things. It's not just, um, you know, bad things that happen. It, we can have false memories, false beliefs that things happen that didn't really happen or things happen to us that actually happened to someone else. Um, those kinds of things, those happen all the time. Um, but the ones that pertain to abuse that have been retrieved through hypnosis or dreams, those ha have um, a special quality. You know, we talked about the Freudian um, notions of repression and those kinds of things earlier. And a lot of people are very suspicious about, um, you know, one's ability to recover. Um, well, let's put it first, like, would you repress memories of abuse is the first question that some researchers have. Like, for example, Elizabeth Loftus um, argues those kinds of events are more likely to become flashbulb memories than they are to become repressed. And then is material that's retrieved through hypnosis and or dream interpretation reliable? And so there's some questions surrounding this topic. So I'm going to go ahead and stop talking. Sorry, this looks like my URL is broken, but I'll have the correct one in the playlist for you. A case um, that actually helped California to decide to stop using repressed you know, recovered repressed memories as testimonials um, based on this case that you'll see in this video. Um, I think I have another video coming up in a second. Hold on. Um, yeah. So I'll have that in the playlist. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about how we form false memories. And then um, you can watch a video about the loss in the mall case. Um, so when we are storing a memory, we, as we already have discussed, include context and other kinds of factors in with that memory when we store it. And then anytime we retrieve that memory, we are likely to tie in with that memory things that we're thinking right now, currently, or whatever the context is right now, right? And so every time we retrieve a memory, there's a likelihood of updating that memory and tagging to it things that were not originally related to it, but now have become related with it. Um, and so we can inadvertently take an intact memory, a valid memory, and start attaching false components to it. Um, and the thing is, our brain doesn't know the difference between the parts that happened at the time versus the parts that have been added on since. Every time you retrieve the memory, it's like the brain seeing it for the first time in this context. It doesn't know. And so um, it can be very confusing to, to sort out the parts of a memory that are valid from the original experience and those parts that have been added on subsequently. Maybe inferences that we've drawn subsequently, right? A lot of times as we gain more information about an experience, that new information gets tagged along with the old information and becomes part of that original memory. And now suddenly we think we always knew something that we only just recently have added on. Um, and that's, that contributes to the fallibility of memory. A lot of times we see this with eyewitnesses where as they've been interviewed or they talk to the other witnesses or they've gone home and they've just thought about the event. Um, they'll start tagging on new information that was not part of the original scene and they'll start to draw inferences and their biases will start to emerge. And so that we can end up with eyewitnesses testifying to things that have nothing to do with actually what actually happened in the incident. Um, they start firmly believing that all along they knew this or that or that this was present or wasn't present and those kinds of things. Um, so false, the formation of false memories is largely due to um, these tendencies to retrieve memories and tack on additional details that don't belong with that original memory. Now, one of the ways that Elizabeth Loftus discovered that people um, will expand upon things that never happened to them but start to internalize them and believe that they really did was through a, a study that she called the lost in the mall study so i've got that queued up next in your um playlist and so um i think that's where i want to leave us right now sorry i'm just checking up, uh, make sure i'm in the right place yeah because i have one more video i want you to queue up um yeah so i think that's a good place to stop so let's go ahead and stop here sorry uh to look like I don't know my own PowerPoints, but I kind of got lost in the mall here talking about my PowerPoints. Um, so uh, 
yeah, lost in the models where we'll leave off. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about suggestibility in the next lecture.